In 2008, two titans of the corporate world, Procter & Gamble, manufacturers of various household items, and Google, burgeoning king of the internet, agreed to go on an unusual and interesting adventure. The company swapped two dozen employees for several weeks to share knowledge and culture. On the surface, it looked like an odd fit. P&G was known for having a very rigid structured culture, while Google was emerging as the model for the workplace of the future, where employees could play video games and ride scooters in the building. Despite their differences, both companies had something they wanted from the other. Although they spent $8 billion on advertising worldwide, P&G's ads weren't having the reach they wanted. Google could help them reach the younger demographic who were spending increasingly large amounts of time online, but they really didn't understand the importance of corporate branding. The endeavor resulted in one of P&G's most successful Super Bowl ads, the Talking Stain. This exercise showed how both organizations, wildly successful individually, looked to unlearn their previously held beliefs about what worked best in their industry and learn about new ways to do things. Today, we're going to discuss how critical thinking helps us challenge the things we think we know and what effect that has on our mental agility. Let's think significantly. Hello, everyone. My name is Pete, and I'll be one of your guides as we explore this notion of challenging the things we think we know. With me, as always, is the engine that makes this train run, Melissa. Well, hello, everyone. I am indeed Melissa, but Pete, you are absolutely being too kind to introduce me as the engine, especially as I'm over here trying to look up the talking stain, which I was not <laughs> familiar with. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a, it's a I, I can't wait to see it because I, I, now I'm very curious. My interest is peaked. Um, I'm definitely jazzed about the topic today, though. I don't want to get too sidetracked here. Um, and as we normally do at the top of all of our podcasts, uh, we tend to set the table. And so I am suggesting that we get on the same page as far as how we're defining critical thinking. So are you up for comparing definitions? Oh, sure. I'm always up for that. You want to start? Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to. Uh, I just did rock paper scissors and yeah, I no, won. that's fine. That's fine. You, yeah, <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure if I won or I lost, but I'll go first. You, you didn't participate, so by default, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so in preparation, uh, I went directly to the font of critical thinking knowledge, the Center for Critical Thinking. Okay. Okay. Its founder Richard Paul said the following about critical thinking. Critical thinking is the art of thinking about thinking with a view to improving it. Critical thinkers seek to improve thinking in three interrelated phases. They analyze thinking, they assess thinking, and they upgrade thinking as a result. Okay. Analyzing, assessing, and upgrading. That's, that's what the, uh, I love how you're like the founder. And I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, I, I thought mean, that was Socrates, but I okay, mean, my bad. It I, was I Richard think, Paul. Yeah. I don't think it gets much uh, much more on, on message as the center for critical thinking, though. I mean. Right? And kids who don't read good, too. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. All right. Okay. So I think we're on the same page. So my definition uh, of critical thinking, I actually framed it as what makes a person a critical thinker is, is to the extent by which he or she regularly improves their thinking by, by critiquing it. So the goal here, kind of like you were alluding to, is perpetual improvement. So much like we talked about in the last episode, there really is no conclusion. There's no end, right? It's the perpetual journey. So with critical thinking, just like you were saying, it's, it's kind of iterative, right? We're always having changing circumstances, new knowledge is being introduced, and then boom, like we reassess and kind of start the process all over again. Mm -hmm. So I always sort of like think about critical thinking about it. We take like a little microscope to sort of like go in, which then sort of then ultimately pops out like a, a broader lens, makes our vision crisper, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I can totally see that. This makes me think of a uh, this whole topic makes me think of a book that I got from a mentor that I, I respected a great deal 
when I was when I was a young man, still figuring out how to be a professional. Okay. Uh, he gave me a copy of Albert Hubbard's book, A Message to Garcia, oh. which which I'm sure uh, I would be amazed if any of our listening audience uh, was familiar with it. Mm -hmm. It's it's an incredibly short read, uh, but it was written in 1899, so the language can be challenging in parts. Um, you know, it's written in that like the common vernacular of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but the gist of the book is that it is invaluable to be able to find your own answers, to solve your own problems without needing to be told what to do or how to do it. So what you're saying is don't be turned off by like the King James version of the message to Garcia. <laughs> right, he, right, yeah. You must it rely on self -ith, that sort of thing. Like muddle through it because it's going to be worth it in the end. Yes, I, I think it, I, I got quite a bit out of it, yes. Um, but it's it's so rare this this skill set is so rare that the entire book and again it's not a very long read so if you want to check it out it's like 13 pages um, oh wow okay yeah. it's like a pamphlet okay es essentially yeah okay um the entire book though was written in appreciation of someone who did just that like it was it was such a rare thing that this person felt the need to immortalize this guy's efforts in 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 a book in a pamphlet whatever we want to call it so the lesson here is do not depend on your teachers to give you all the answers. Don't, don't depend on us to give you the answers. Oh, Go out and find the answers for yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I know how you hate coffee cup wisdom, I do. But, I, but I definitely get strong, give a man to fish and you feed him today, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime vibes about this topic. Mm-hmm. Well, more than that, I hate giving students answers. I'm like, figure it out. Like, you know, you know, yeah, I'm all about that. Like that's, that's really what you're trying to do is, is right. Make yes. sure they, they can fish. That's where I'm right. going that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I think, I think, right. Teaching them to go find the answers or to be able to rely on themselves to find the answers is so much more valuable than just being like, yeah, it's this. I totally agree with you. And for me, honestly, this might be getting a titch off topic, but mm. I, I like just making sure that I'm soaking that sort of curiosity, right? When people are like, well, what about this, right? You, you mm -hmm. yeah, let's go down those rabbit holes because that's ultimately like really where your answers are going to be found. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The most interesting things are found in rabbit holes. I agree. 90% you know, of this podcast is based on us going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> rabbit holes. Yes. Yeah. Or being like, what if, or I was thinking. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, it's the damnedest thing. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, we should probably, uh, this is a great segue into how this episode, this topic actually came to be. So uh, I think I'm going to offer our significant others a little sneak peek behind the veil, if you're okay with that. Oh, of course. So this idea surfaced because Pete and I were talking about how many things have changed, like knowledge has changed since we were in school. And I was specifically mm. talking about how Pete one is no longer a prime number. And he's like, yeah. wait, what? Yeah, I, th I think I had made the mistake of saying something about it being prime and you were like, no, it's not. I was like, oh no. Yeah, but the way I learned it wasn't was like I was teaching math one day and here I am like the first prime numbers and these kids were like, you're teaching us? And I was like, <laughs> like screeching at the record, like, oh, is that not cool now? I'm like, all right, holds chalk. What else has changed? Like, well, Pluto's not a planet anymore. And I'm like, what is happening? Ran outside to make sure, you know, we weren't being like stormed by troopers or anything. That's right. Crazy. That's right. I need to go back in time and change my, my solar system diorama. Right. That's one less styrofoam ball we need. So I know. You know what I'm saying, yeah. I want that, that was smaller. The one, that, was the one, that was the one that always fell off too. It was the furthest one out. It was the hardest to keep on there. Always. Which if that doesn't tell you why it didn't need to be a planet, I don't know what was. Seriously. I think right. that was the determining factor. Exactly. But we came up with a ton of these things, and we're going to share a few of them now yeah, with you so, because you too might be like, excuse me, huh? Right, right. Yeah. Some of these will be like, I didn't know that was a thing people knew in the first place, but, but humorous. <laughs> so the, the one that, that hit me the hardest uh, that I have carried with me for, it seems like, all my life is that you can't fold a piece of paper more than seven times. Once you reach seven times, you can't fold it anymore. And I've, I learned that that is not true. The record is now 13 times. 
Okay. Now, if you're like me and you're like, what is he speaking of? <laughs> so I was like, explain to me. He, then he explained like, take any size piece of paper and then fold it completely, you know, in half, like edges right. meeting. Right. And then again, and then again. And and I, I had never been challenged by this, nor did I know this information. So I didn't feel I, so like shysted, you know, that this had changed. I, have you tried it since I told you about it? I did try it. <laughs> <laughs> I can only do seven. and I'm, I, I know it's a damn good thing. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking Let's of see. seven, we uh -huh. were talking about also gum because Pete, hello. Right. How long does it take to digest gum? Seven years. That's the, that's the going rate. Seven, that's why you don't want to swallow gum, right. but turns out, nope. Digest like everything else. Yeah. I, I, I almost wonder if that wasn't more wives tale than fact at the time, but you know, yeah, it, it, it fits. It fits. It fits the narrative. Yeah. 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 You want to talk about your dinosaur one that rocked yeah, yeah, the world? Yeah. yeah. So right, I, as I was telling you earlier today, I was a, I was a, a in addition to doing my solar system diorama, <laughs> I was a, I was a huge dinosaur nerd as a kid, and uh, and you know the big ones when I was little were the brontosaurus and the triceratops were two of the like mainstays. They were the superstars, and, and now they they don't even exist. They realize that those what they were classifying as brontosaurus and triceratops were actually different dinosaurs. Uh, so, so those names, those dinosaurs aren't even currently. So triceratops actually is currently a thing because the branding for that was so strong that they moved it onto the, the actual animal that it was supposed to be in the first place. Oh, I see. But like brontosaurus don't exist anymore. It's crazy. That, that blows my mind. Yeah. I feel like you're telling me like Hulk Hogan really wasn't part of like WWE <laughs> wrestling. And I'm like, wait, what? The Brontosaurus, yeah. man. Yeah, there's uh, so many other things I could tell you about Hulk Hogan. That's crazy. Not, yeah. That's got to be its own episode, I feel like. Pin that <laughs> one. Uh, what is uh, how about, how about your, uh, how about the, uh, from your time in Hawaii about the mountain there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Tallest mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks Everest, right? I mean, there's movies about it. you just say Everest and people are like, <gasps> you know, the, the audible gas, but right. it's Mauna Kea. When measured from the seafloor. Yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah, I guess it depends on where you start your measurement at, right? Right, right. I right. mean, you can't, you can't scale that one from the bottom, but, but it actually goes down well below the sea level. Right. And to be this massive mountain. Who knew? Well, I'm, yeah. that's the one that'll be easier to climb. So I'd be like, oh. <laughs> that's right. That's you right. Think you're so impressive climbing yeah. Everest. Check Watch me out. This. Yeah, I've scaled the tallest mountain in the world. That's yeah. right. Hello. <laughs> yes. Uh, what else did we learn? What was about uh, colors that we yeah learned? colors? I was gonna say we got um so we learned as as children that there was you know Roy G Biv was the mnemonic that we used to remember red orange yellow green blue indigo violet, but now it's popular to have taken indigo off the off the spectrum so it's red orange yellow green blue violet instead. Yeah, Roy G Biv. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, it's, it's right. They'll need to come up with a new mnemonic maybe, but, but well. Yeah. But Pete, you were the one telling me that that indigo really wasn't a thing to begin with. It was just uh, freaking right. Newton threw it in there because right. he like he wanted like he wanted a seven, right? He wanted seven a, things, which was the perfect number according to Greek sophists. Yeah, isn't that crazy? But not yeah. how, yeah. So that might he might have been the guy who came up with how many years it takes to digest the gum. Too. <laughs> it could be. So could yeah. be sevens right. are running wild here today. Yeah, crazy. Um, taste buds. You know, back uh -huh. in the day, we would draw the little diagram. During like February, like, cause that's dental hygiene month. So you'd always do the tongue in school. <laughs> right. right. And you know, certain tastes on certain parts of the tongue. No, not right. so much. Yeah, no, that that, was, mm -mm. yeah. I always thought that was weird that, you know, certain parts of your tongue could only taste certain things, but. Well, and then they do it in school. And then you have this, like this bias thing going on. You're like, oh, I taste lemon so much better up front. Right. You know? and right. It's just a fallacy. It's just crazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and going hand in hand with that, something else I remember from, from when we were young is talking about how camels' humps stored water, which made their, their travel across the desert so, uh, so th that made them so well suited for that. Right. Um, and in fact, the humps are fat. Oh it's got, God. it's got no, it's got nothing to do with water at all. It's just, it's just a, a, a high fat concentration so that they don't have to eat while they're going across the desert well now i feel like i'm gonna use the so to my benefit and i'm just gonna like grab like a hunk and i'm gonna be like that that is water my friend i am storing <laughs> up some water right there 
No, so, that's not belly fat. That right. is water storage. It's all water weight. All water weight. Yeah. With speaking of water weight, uh, last one we should probably, and then we'll we'll wrap this up because I got I got I got one more after this. But go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. I don't want to. I I was going to talk about the uh, the rain drop. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Rain. Everyone thinks it's drop like a teardrop. Another thing we draw in school. And, you know, and then of course you have, you make it in conjunction with the clouds, right. with the cotton balls. No, rain is actually, and I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Shaped like a hamburger bun. Stop yeah. it. Little, Stop little, it. No tails, little fat drops. Yeah. I know, but I don't know what, how I feel about this. I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to enjoy my walks in the rain as much, but I digress. I really have no... Right. I guess I could not walk in the rain, but hamburger buns coming at you. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Yeah. Right. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs and hamburger buns. Truly. <laughs> I know. What was so, the last one? So the last one was um, chameleons. Okay. Okay. We learned, we learned that they change color to camouflage themselves in, with their surroundings. Mm -hmm. But, but they've now learned that they change color to help them regulate their body temperature and to communicate with other chameleons. Oh my goodness, seriously? That's that's what the going uh knowledge is, yeah. I wow. mean check in again in 10 years, it might be something else, but right. Right, why... but right now that's the that's the going thing. So if you did put them on something and they change to match it, so yeah, they're not doing it to camouflage themselves, they're being like, yo, party's over here. Yeah, I I think so. I you know, I thought through that and I think it's gotta be that they're trying to not be hotter or cooler than this than, than their surroundings right oh i see they're, I see. they're trying to reflect whatever you know radiation is is being reflected by everything around it wow Crazy. I, and that's that is totally me just making something up i did not look that up <laughs> so it's for all so, of you listening so, right so it challenged me on it please look it up right. call me dum dum on social media respond to one of our posts and tell yeah. me hey pete you're full of crap <laughs> or, or, or maybe not that right yeah <laughs> but you can at pete because i don't i don't want to yeah. be blamed for the chameleons i i don't know and i'm not spouting off um, at the mouth yeah. here yeah I'm, exactly i'm i'm risking the ire of the chameleon lobby <laughs> at least not the camels awesome. yeah right right camels but anyways are chameleon, right. so this got us thinking though the, yeah. you know going through all the stuff got us thinking should we really be thinking that what we learn in school is the gospel and i should note as a, as an educator, that sometimes what we learn in school is right at that moment. And then additional knowledge comes along and that changes what we know to be true. And that would be awesome because that is exactly what we're talking about in this episode about using knowledge to challenge our knowledge base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while that is most certainly what happened in, in many of these instances that we just went through, like they mm -hmm. redefined, you know, the, the triceratops were, you know, right. they got a better look at a raindrop. Right. We, we do know that critical thinking is not exactly, let's say, encouraged in the American public school system. Yeah. Contrary to what some people would have you believe. Yes. But I, I came across, I came across a book called uh, Academically Adrift, right? It's, it was written in 2011 by Richard Aram uh -huh. and Joseph uh, Roxa. Yep that refuted the popular belief that critical thinking skills get developed in higher education. Mm -hmm. oh, Isn't this the one where they, they, they polled employers and like, what do you think about your employees? Right. Yes. So, so right. The statistic is that, is that 75% of employers claim that the students they hire lack the ability to think critically and solve problems. Mm -hmm. And, and I, yeah, because I know what I'm familiar with this book. And so the whole idea is like, well, just, just, you know, higher education will fix that, but that right. wasn't the case because the employers were also saying this about people who had like 12 and 16 years of like formal education. Right. Yeah. So, you know, this really runs counter to the claims of lots of institutions and even some educators that, you know, that, that we, I'm going to put myself in this, you mm -hmm. know, cause I, I, I identify with this, you know, that we teach our students how to think, not what to think. Okay, but, but you have to realize that this is the result of an education system that was overhauled a century ago to more closely resemble the things that we had learned from the business world, right? This, Wait, you're saying a century ago. You're saying 100 years ago. 
Correct. Yeah, right. This there was an effort led by by Elwood Coverley, mm-hmm. who uh, wanted to make sure that that children were getting the education that they needed to help advance the nation, oh. and not what their parents wanted them to learn, which would have been more limited. And again, like if if this doesn't sound like something that we're talking about right now in this nation, still, uh, I don't know what does. Yeah, sure, absolutely. It's like the more things change, the more things stay the same. That's it's exactly true. What he did to make sure schools were performing was he used surveys to uh, essentially grade schools. Okay. Uh, and that became the basis for what we now know as standardized testing. Well, I can tell you that those standardized tests are still grading schools to this day. No, right. No, that's exactly right. It's just, it went from being a survey to standardized test. That was the point I was trying to make. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yes. But so I'm taking it further. So then standardized tests that will become like the survey for how well the school is going. Right. Because so many critical metrics are based on those test scores. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really like the report card for the school. And that's usually tied to funding and like, um, number of specialists you get at your school and, you know, keeping your job is really dependent on how well your students do on those tests. So sure. this is a, I, I'm waiting for you to do the callback. I'm waiting. I'm I even <laughs> must be like frothing at the mouth to be like, you know, we did an episode on this last season. We, we, we actually did. We talked about this very, uh, dynamic in episode 111, which was the, the Intel on intelligence Okay, wh- if- where we, where we talked about IQ tests measuring only what's being taught and not actual IQ. You have many gifts, Pete, but I'm going to tell you one of them that always like, just, I'm like, just speechless usually is how you're like, you know what episode is. I'm like, I think something about this happened like last year. And you're like, it's episode 111. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right then. Wow. Anyway, don't, don't, if you run into me on the street, don't ask me because I probably won't know. I just... (laughs) I just, I just happen to grab these things as I need them for, for when we're going to record. You just fetch them. All right. Well, well done. Well done. You're fetching (laughs) better than I am. That's for sure. I'm still like, did we happen to, as like I eat like sort of avocado toast and (laughs) stare wistfully into the distance. Yeah. It's all good. So what we've done uh, over the last hundred years since Mr. Coverly made his changes is we've allowed the industrialization of the workforce which we, we celebrate Henry Ford for, right? For the industrial revolution, the, the assembly line that he brought to us. We allowed that thinking to take hold of our education system. And, and all of this is to say that, that we created a monster when we thought that education could be treated like production. It can't. And our ranking in the world when it comes to proficiencies in all subjects shows us just that. We became successful as a nation based on doing things outside the box. Right, that what we what people refer to as American innovation, which was based on citizens of a young nation bringing knowledge from their from their home countries and applying it to the new situation in this country, mm-hmm. and learning from that experience rather than having you know specific rote knowledge jammed into their heads. Sure. So interestingly, when I was preparing for this episode, I uncovered something that said that our real troubles started much earlier than Henry Ford and his assembly Hmm. line. Okay. All right. And what's very interesting is that tucked into this article, there was a faux pas, but yes, before I get to that, let me just tell Hmm. you the point that the article that I was reading was trying to make was that it was engineering that really led us down this path where we are beholden to what they call reductionism, Hmm. Okay. which is basically taking this very complex phenomenon, right? And breaking it down into much simpler or more fundamental level, like tasks or concepts. Sure. Um, especially when those like micro parts provide sufficient explanation, like we dumb mm. things down. Sure. Okay? But what was crazy about it is, is there's a knowledge error in it. And as I'm reading it, it says, since Newton wrote the laws of thermodynamics, a dominant mechanical worldview has permeated education in Western societies at large. And I was like, Newton huh. wrote the laws of thermodynamics. And I was like, oh my <laughs> gosh. I'm like, here's another damn thing I didn't know in school, right? <laughs> I was like, all right. Uh, yeah, I know about his like three laws of motion, law of universal gravitation, but like thermo, is that like yeah. 
Jewel and all those other cats, you know? Right. Yeah. So anyways, I ended up looking it up. Sure enough, it's a mistake in this article about how we ended up dumbing everything down, which I was like, huzzah, how meta. That's, yeah, I'd say it's very meta. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the gist is the same, right? Whether you're talking about Newton's second law or the second law of thermodynamics. Yes. The emphasis on the mechanical got us primed to distill an infinitely complex world into manageable bite-sized parts. Sure. And those little bite-sized parts are what our human minds can make sense of. And that's helped us become immensely successful at mass production and manufacturing and at science and technology, which are great things that we should all be very proud of. Well, I agree with what you're saying that being able to break things down into bits and bytes has its place. And, and I would even argue that it is part of critical thinking that going down to the crevices. And as long mm -hmm. as we're, you know, constantly doing what, what did you say earlier? The analyzing, assessing and upgrading. Yeah. Then I think we're on the right path. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, to learn stuff, it's it's cool to break it into easily digestible portions, but in the spirit of ensuring that we're never done learning, we want to always be checking what we think we know. You know, otherwise, how would we ever know that brontosaurus aren't really a thing? Right. And I, I can't help but to think of that <laughs> contemplative mathematician who was brave enough to be like, you know, so, so, over a whiskey, something right. I've been thinking. I, I don't know about this one being prime. Uh, hear this, me this, out. You yeah, know, this one, it's awful. It's awful. Full yeah. of itself. I mean, let's have a discussion about what distinct means, folks, right? The distinct <laughs> factors. Yeah, exactly. Even though, you know, everyone around the table was certainly be like, but that's how we learned it. That's how, that's just how we learned it. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think what we were saying here is that, that we have to stay agile, mm -hmm. make, make it our practice to alternate between the balcony and the weeds. Oh, I love that you said that. Yes. That's exactly how I think about it. Like big picture, little picture, alternate right. between like, yeah. The microscope, the telescope. I think we've given everyone enough examples of what this looks like. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Repetition oh. is the key to clarity. <laughs> You're like, big spoon, little spoon. My <laughs> turn. Yes, right. You know, I, I actually came across a study on Agile when I was preparing for this episode. Which, it, that, that makes sense to me because I think critical thinking and Agile kind of go hand in glove. But I do have to say, you know, when I, when you say Agile, I think proc project management, you know, like automatically that's my go-to. Oh, oh yeah, I do too. I mean, I'm definitely familiar with, with agile as used in that sense. You know, as you can imagine, I do enjoy that, the agile project management employs a position called scrum master, which mm -hmm. makes this old rugger smile. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. Absolutely. If yes, you're like no more waterfall for me, folks, I'm going completely <laughs> agile because I want to be this one guy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what's this, uh, what's the study you came across? Okay, so what I found was a study conducted by the Corn Ferry Institute that showed the many benefits of mental or learning agility. For example, only 15% of the global workforce were deemed to be highly agile. And for those who are highly agile, they are twice as likely to get promoted. Mm -hmm. It also showed that companies with highly agile CEOs post a 25% higher profit margins than average. Okay. As I, as I squint here, um, I hate to, I hate to be the naysayer here, but let me ask you, do you know if this study defined agile, like highly agile to be exact? Do you know? I, it didn't specify the, the portion, the, what I was able to read didn't specify. I, I'd imagine it's a, it's a percentile of agility, not, mm -hmm. I don't think there was like an actual, uh, metric. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Well, the reason I'm just asking is because I think you could probably ask 10 people and get 15 different answers if you ask them like <laughs> highly agile really means. Right. Um, I'm sure. I think it's kind of like how everyone's using like work-life balance these days. And I'm like, what? There's a huge range of definitions for that. Is that like bring your chinchilla to work or you only want to work three <laughs> work days? Like, what does that mean to you? Yeah. I think between you and I, we could at least start the discussion. Mm -hmm. And then if our listeners have something they'd like to add to further it, they can certainly contact us or connect with us via social media. Yeah, yeah, they sure can. We we know because we get inquiries and, and mail. Yes, yes. We do. You've got mail. Yes. All right. So uh, if I'm up, okay, I would say someone who is agile is able to easily transverse situations with high high VUCA, to borrow another word from the change uh, management mm, field. So mm, we have those landscapes that have a lot of volatility uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. 
So somebody who's easily sort of able to, or makes it look easy, able to transverse that, that they're agile. They're like the, they're like the water bugs of the business world. Like no matter what's brewing right below the surface, they're just like hittering across, making it across the pond. I, I just want everybody to know that we don't have a special effects department. That's all we do. <laughs> I am the special effects department. <laughs> That's a hell of a visual you've got there. I, I'll agree that being able to function in, in environments with high VUCA is definitely a sign of an agile persona. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say that people who are agile anticipate change mm -hmm. and they can really operate independently. Yeah, I would say that too. I think if you can anticipate change then too, you're not really scared of it right? You, you yes. sort of feel like it's manageable. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Which makes you then not want to necessarily shirk away from it. Um, I'm going to say, uh, in light of our podcast here that an agile person, an agile employee is someone who is continuously learning because they know that the skills of today, like, you know, have an expiration date. Sure. You know? Yeah. So the agile you know, are people who are absorbing everything happening in their industry. They're, they're always sort of like the ones who are like leaning in, leaning forward. Right, right. Not just absorbing everything that's happening, but anticipating what's coming. Oh, yes. And, yes. and learning that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people who have high learning agility, and some of this might sound familiar if you listen to our last episode, mm -hmm. uh, they continuously seek out new challenges. Mm -hmm. right? They actively seek feedback from others in order to grow and develop. They tend to be self-reflective. Mm -hmm. uh, they evaluate their experiences and they draw practical conclusions. Well, hot damn, Pete. I think we've got a full circle here. We're right back to critical thinking. I love put a, it. Put a bow on it. I almost <laughs> said put a bow on it and put it in the mail, but that makes no sense whatsoever. It really doesn't. No, it does no, not. <laughs> the USPS says, no, please don't do that. That's right. But wait, before, before we go wrapping up. Okay. Uh, you said something to me before we started about, you had a fable for me, something. Oh, Greek, yes. Perhaps. My, my Greek fable. Yes, yes. 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 All right. All right. I'll be quick. Uh, so gather around kitties story time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. So way back, way back when, uh, before the think tanks in Burbank that told us what critical thinking was all about, there was a man named Socrates. Yes. So um, the Oracle of Delphi had revealed to one of Socrates' friends that Socrates was, dude, the wisest man in Athens. So this gets back to Socrates. And Socrates was not a, an, an ego-laden man by any chance. So he decides that he's going to try to prove the oracle wrong. And so what he does is he sets out on foot um, to find out if anyone knew what was truly worthwhile in life. Because anyone who knew that would surely be wiser than him because he didn't mm -hmm. know. So sure. he sets out about questioning everyone he can find, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and nobody can give him a satisfactory answer. Instead, this is what happens. They all pretend to know something that they clearly do not. They, uh, they were faking the funk, as the kids don't say. I, uh, I find this so hard to believe. Right? Yeah, right? It's not like you <laughs> ever encountered this yeah. in my last Human, work meeting. Humans, humans have been humans forever. Exactly. Anyways, long story, a little bit longer. He realizes... <laughs> that the oracle might actually be right, and that he ta -da, does happen to be the wisest man in Athens because he alone was prepared to admit his ignorance rather than pretend mm. he, to know something that he didn't know. That's, isn't that, isn't that like a humble brag, by the way? That it's it totally, it totally oh is Oh my actually. God, I can't even, yeah. yes. Like, like I'm not, I don't know anything, but that makes me the smartest man in the world. I'm so. a genius. So yeah. I guess I'll take it. Yes. Do you know what that makes me think of is the adage, um, Anyone who holds a true opinion without understanding it is like a blind man on the right road. Oh, okay. That right? I mean, because... Blind man on the right road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we base more and more of our decisions on how we feel. Reasoning, because we feel this way, we must be right. Sure. And we fall prey to believing the supremacy of our opinions over everything else. That's why it's important to be critical about our beliefs, to challenge our our deepest held opinions and not become beholden to one point of view. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a more fitting way to wrap up this discussion than with some wisdom straight from Socrates through you. So, <laughs> so how would you like to send us out? It was a nice way of Pete being like, we are out of time, Melissa. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, All right. I, 
So Pete and I, we would love to continue this discussion with you all on social media. Tell us about the last thing you came across that was different than what you learned in school. Like what sort of revelation you've had? Uh, what did you do when you were like presented with this information? Or like, if you're like me teaching math and confronted about this information? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us your thoughts on other advantages of mental agility. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you spend a lot of time in environments that foster that? Reach out and share with us. Right, and then tell us what what uh, special interest group that is so we can join it because we're all about <laughs> we're Fast. all about being yeah. mentally flexible. Yes. So you can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram, of course, at Think Sig Pod, and on Facebook and LinkedIn by searching for Think Significantly. If you enjoyed our conversation, please invite your curious friends to listen. Melissa and I will be back next week to explore another way we can question everything. And until then, we encourage everyone to think significantly about the world around you. Na, 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 na.